Welcome this evening to how to write to attract Google search results. My name is Dante St. James. I'll be taking you through this evening's presentation or this afternoon if you're in WA. If you're in Queensland, well into your evening. And I'm sitting here in the Northern Territory in my temporary office situation, just waiting for my new office to open. Thank you for joining me. I hope you really enjoy this and take something away from it that allows you to learn more about how you can learn more about uh, writing for Google and the kinds of things that Google is looking for to help you to search better. First, a quote from Rand Fishkin, founder of Moz, which is one of the search engine optimization tools used by probably millions. It's a very popular one and one of the early ones too. Better content is outweighing more content. And that's very true for SEO and for writing material for Google. The better the material is, it's going to outweigh you just doing more of it. Because just like social media, you can increase how much social media you're doing in a day from one to five posts. But because it's really bad content, it's not going to move you forward. The same thing happens with blogs and page content and product pages. If you don't get them right, if you don't get them to a level of quality that makes a difference, it's not going to move you up those Google rankings at all. And you're going to be stuck with just tons of bad pages and bad content. What we're going to look at today is how Google works, a little bit about how it, what it looks for and how you can work with that. We're going to look at what you can do out of all those Google big things that you can do yourself. And then we're going to look at writing for search um, and how it's basically writing for humans. When you write for people, you're essentially writing for search as well because Google is looking for that. And I've got tons of examples we're going to get. But first of all, a little bit of a look about how Google works. How Google works basically comes down to the ability for you to match any one of their 250 odd different algorithmic checks that they're looking for. So they might be looking for um, something in your particular industry or a level of detail if you're in a technical place, or they might be looking for uh, social proof. There are lots of reviews in that. And all these things are all bundled together and weighted differently depending upon the context that someone's searching in. It used to be just the same example of you write stuff and it'll appear. And if you're the person who got there first, you get all the traffic. Not quite so these days. Sometimes it is about how long you've been around, but just as often it's also about how popular your page or your particular source of information comes over time. So for instance, the ranking factors that we look at, and if I'm looking over here, so I'm looking at another big screen over in this direction. The first ranking factor to get looked at is a trust level of your website. And that's something which you earn over time. It's something which you don't get just simply for opening up a website today and going, oh yeah, I should be getting the top of the rankings because of the wonderful work I've done and the writing that I've been able to pull off on the site. That trust level, is why your competitors who have been around a lot longer than you are probably showing up higher on Google than you are. <clears throat> it's also then about the second factor, which is how popular your website or page is. Now, this is where we try to game the system and buy Google ads, for instance. Let's buy some ads for three months to get lots and lots of traffic through to our site. Google knows what that is and knows that it is not organic popularity. What they're looking for here is the popularity of the site organically. It's coming in naturally to your page. Um, the same thing goes if you do some sort of uh, um, a, uh, what do you call it? A, Gosh, lost the word promotion. If you do a prize giveaway or a promotion that generates a million people to come to your site one day and the next day it drops down to less than 20 people, well, you're not going to get that popularity score higher. It's going to be something that's sustained over time. Then there's the relevance of and relevance of links, a number of and relevance of links to your site or your page. And this is where we talk about backlinks, where other people are linking through to you. Then we look at how well you've optimized your site or your page to be indexed, the quality of the domain registration, and more importantly, the quality and speed of your web hosting. That's incredibly important when it comes to a website that it actually runs fast. Then we look at the performance of your page for visitors. This is where the page is specifically geared to the context of which people are looking for you in. So if they're looking for a quick bit of information and they can see at Google that this is what they've been doing from one site to the other site to another site, they're comparison shopping, they're in and out quickly. Then if you're performing really well for that context, then in that context where they're searching, you will do well. However, if they're searching in another complete different context, they're looking to actually do some shopping today. Well, then if you've optimized just for people to come in and out really quickly, you may not be then optimized then for them to be converting a sale. 
So there's a fine line you have to walk in order to get all these things set up in the right way, depending upon the point of the customer's journey towards you, whether they're in that awareness stage where they don't really know about you, but now they're starting to learn about you, down to the next stage of the sales funnel, which is all about getting to the point where they are comparison shopping. They know they now need what you have. They know why they want what you have, but they're comparing along a long line of other options in Google until finally get, get down to the bottom of that funnel and they're looking to buy that item that you're selling, not just from you, but from whoever seems to grab their fancy at that last moment. And then finally, one of the smaller factors that has to do with uh, ranking, and trust me, this is like, there's 240, 245, 250 different factors. I've just pulled out some of the groups of some of those factors. So within each one of these factors, there's lots and lots of little factors that contribute to that. Social media links, mentions, and reputation are all based around a concept called social proof. Social proof is not what you say about yourself, but it's what everybody else is saying about you. Not what you say about yourself on social media, what other people say. For example, reviews, recommendations on Facebook, um, going to TripAdvisor, if you've got a business that deals in travel and tourism, all those sources are important sources of social proof. Social proof is just simply what people are saying about you and how well they're saying it about you. So saying it really well about you, that's fantastic. That allows you to get a really good reputation out there. And a lot of that's driven by social media. A lot of that's driven by Google reviews. A lot of that's driven by Facebook recommendations. And some of it's just driven by recommendations made on people's blogs, on their travel blogs, on their Instagram bios, on LinkedIn. And one of the most important places for that is in LinkedIn articles. But we'll go into a little bit more about that later. So if we break that all down, the things that you can really move the needle on when it comes to what you do in your website, we're not talking about you being able to change the trust level because that takes time. We're not talking about you making your site more popular because that takes time and it takes consistency over a long period of time. In reality, the only two things that you can really make a really dis like concerted change on is the performance of your page for visitors. So you've written your material in such a way that it reflects what people are doing, the context in which they're looking for the information that you're serving up on your page. And secondly, there's a lot you can do with optimizing your site or your page to be indexed. In other words, making sure that there's stuff on the page. Excuse me, I just like, it suddenly got really, really warm in this room again. Um, I've got to turn down the air a little bit. Um, it's just in my new office and it's just a little bit, things aren't just working the way I want them to. So that how well you've optimized your page to be indexed is how you work with things like your titles, how you work with your, your metadata. And if you don't know what that is, it's okay. You don't have to learn everything about this today. This is a bit of a starting point for learning how to write things. So you're not gonna be able to achieve everything today, but what you'll be able to do is at least go away and go, okay, I've got my notes here. How do I do this? How do I do this? How do I start this? And then we've got a great deal with Business Station to get you uh, some access to people like myself who can give you a bit of a hand with that with three hours of mentoring. So how well you want your page to be indexed is basically what you do on your site, on your page, to make sure you're indexed better than you were before. I've actually turned off the aircon. Let's turn it back on again. Right, now that should do is a bit better. So... The first thing we need to do when it comes to writing the right things for your website is writing stuff that's easy to find and easy to consume. That simply means keeping things short. If you've ever used WordPress and the, the Yoast plugin, it'll often give you recommendations for shorter sentences and Grammarly as a plugin to your computer as well does the same thing. It'll tell you that you need to keep that particular sentence under 20 words or keeping that paragraph under three or four sentences keeping things short sharp and to the point makes it really easy to read really easy to confuse and using things like dot points to break up your text or expansion points or you know something in there even even using some images in there to ensure that people are able to you know, sort of have what we call a thinking break and that thinking break is where they're reading along all that information and all of a sudden boom 
they they hit a break and they can go now i can actually absorb that information this is very important for we have a lot of increased uh, dyslexia happening in the world today and that's just simply because we are just presented with so much information and overwhelm so if we want to make that as simple as possible we make it easier for people to read no matter what their level of dyslexia or um, their literacy happens to be and using simple english in here really really helps that too so you could um, look at something like your top experiences or your top products linked from the front page, but not too much stuff. Your, your aim of your front page is to warmly welcome someone in and let them discover things easily, not to throw a hundred options at them and then go, okay, work this out, because that's quite overwhelming. It's a lot of noise to walk in on. And also having no more than five top level menu items. Now, this is going to be hard. If you think about it, You've got a home link, you've got an about link, you've got a shop link maybe, or a services link, you've got a contact link, you've got maybe privacy policy, you've got our terms and conditions, you've got more information about your blog, for instance. You can get up to seven, eight, nine, ten different menu items. It's too much. We've got to bring that right back. On the desktop, we're often in a rush because we're at work, so we're trying to get to information quickly and easily. Going through 10 different items, there's 10 items we have to read even before we get to actually getting information. If you keep it down to no more than five, and those five are, now remember these days, you do not need a home link. That's all part of your, um, your, your, your icon. So the icon or the, or the logo on your website, that's usually your home link. You know, you don't need a home link. Most of the time when people get into your site and they're reading around and they're exploring, they don't necessarily need a link to go back to that home page. And if they do, the back button does that just as well. We know how to use our back buttons and swipe on our phones and do all that stuff. So we don't necessarily need to get ourselves stuck into something like a home link. And then when it comes to about, about can contain a lot of things underneath it. About can contain things like um, your contact details that releases one thing from the list it can contain a pull down that has things like your mission your vision um, your careers page um, anything like your terms and conditions and privacy policy can all be just listed underneath the about so you've just taken about five six maybe even seven items and crunched them under one thing called about that's a great very very efficient way of getting those links down if i could get my links down on my websites down to at least just two just two items i'd be really really happy but i always find an excuse to just include another very important item on a menu so just try and get it under five in the meantime though you know just just try and get it down a little bit less than what you do by condensing things into pull downs underneath those main end menu items now, what you will go away and do at some point is learn to write a blurb for one of your products using a format, which is like this. The title of the product. So this is the way of getting things shorter. And I've got some great examples of how these work. And I've got a bit of an expansion of this as well. The title of the product, a short paragraph that starts off, or it could be the, the title of the product could be a question. If you've got a, a, if you've got a, a service, for instance, if your service is um, window cleaning, so you want to then start it with, why is it important to keep your windows clean in 2021? And then you answer that straight away. Keeping windows clean means that people are able to see into your store, store, storefront more clearly and they have a better first impression of you. Great. And then you can add a short lot of dot points after that. So you've got the question opening up the blog, that's the title of your blog or your title of your page, and then a short paragraph that answers that directly in the shortest possible way. And now you're going to do like an old school essay at high school and start to write out um, dot points. And the dot points will be, um, it makes it easier for people to see your product. That's a dot point. Dot point number two, allows people to see what they're buying clearly and without struggling. Number three, uh, because it creates a first impression that will last with your customers. Then you can take each one of those dot points as categories of more discussion. So as we go down our page, you take the first dot point and then you expand upon it. Three, four, five paragraphs even. You can go into much more detail if you like, but the key here is to make the initial important information up the top of the article so it can be consumed by skimmers. I'm a skimmer, you may be a skimmer too. People who go to a website and they just sort of scan over what's there, they speed read over what's at the top and goes, usually skip the paragraph and go straight to the dot points. 
and we do it all the time. There's a reason why newspapers now have summaries and dot points at the beginnings of their articles, because people just skip all the guff. They just want to get to the main information. They want to get to the what we call the executive summary, the ability to go past all the rubbish, past all the um, additional information and get to the stuff that really matters. And when you're looking for quick answers for things, quick directions for things, that is oh so important because it allows you to have a fast track into the information you want. And if you need to know more, if you need to expand on it more, if you're a little bit more intellectual, then you're able to get that expanded version of it as well without too much trouble. That expansion information then can go into as much detail as you like, or it can be quite short itself, depending upon how much writing you actually want to do. Now, you want to make sure you write what you're going to write for your visitor. So you're going to, this is for product pages, this is for service pages, and I've got specific examples I'm going to go to in a moment that really explore this with, with an online e-commerce website, specifically selling dresses. So when you write this, you write it for the visitor or for the customer or for the guest or whatever you call your clients. And you focus in on that writing on what's in it for them, not what's so great about you. It's very natural for us to start that process and start writing something which you're going, and we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and we're so good at this, and we won an award for that. And already you've lost that person because there's nothing in there about them. They're looking for a solution to their problems or for some kind of you know, uh, a healing for their issues. They're not looking for you to tell them how good they are. They want to know you, like you, and trust you enough to be able to then buy from you. But they don't do that by you just telling them how good they are. Very few people these days will trust anything that any of us have to say. There's a big problem in today's advertising and marketing world. And that's basically that people are being lied to and burnt so much by marketing and by advertising that they simply don't trust what you have to say. But what they will do is perhaps you know, walk in and start to understand how you understand them. And once they felt understood, then they start to like you. And then when they like you, they'll look for more information about you. That's where you get to tell about you know, your awards you've won or something like that. So you do this by talking in language that points to them. You will have this change. You have what it is between uh, within you to make this work. You are the, the the fire within your life. Talking about people in such a way that you're talking about them, not talking about what you do, enables them to feel like, huh, this is about me. And the empathetic side in humanity means that we really start to perk up when we hear something about ourselves. We hear our name, uh, a dopamine shot in our head goes off and says, oh, that feels good. I like hearing my name. But if you hear that enough times, you start to see your name in anything that's referring to the word you. You have the power within you to do whatever you want. Suddenly means that I, me, Dante, has the power within myself to do whatever I want. Rather than just reading as you, we then interpret it as us with our name attached to it. And then there's, of course, writing about benefits, not just features. When you write about features, you could be saying it's six speed manual. Um, it's got you know 15 vents for air conditioning and it's got a spare tire in the back. And none of those things are telling you about what those things are for. Spare tire is probably pretty easy for 15 vents. Why do you need so many vents? Well, it's to create microclimates in the car. That means that everybody gets the optimum comfort where they're sitting in the car. Fantastic. Now I understand why there's so many of them. Six speed um, transmission. Well, why do you need that much? Because sometimes you need a little bit of extra power out in the open road. Great. I understand the benefit. What well, is in it for me? So you're basically writing about what's in it for them. So what you can do is in your own time, go away and have a look at a website. Look at what a website says about itself. Just look for a local plumber, a local electrician, a local store, any sort of local business and see how that particular website goes about writing uh, to, its class, to its customers. You will find that just about every case, they spend so much time talking about themselves and very little time talking about you as the customer and solving your problem. They go straight into the solution without establishing who it's for. And I have a very good way of doing this um, and making websites make much more sense of this. It's called the story brand method by a guy called Donald Miller. And I use this method all the time to unwind a lot of those websites that go, and we do this, 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 and you just go, I just don't care. No, that means anything to me. It unwinds that and pulls out what the problems are that your particular customers want solved. Now, there might be many problems they want solved, 
but you can start to at least work in the direction of getting it right for them so that they feel like they're listened to, understood and catered for. So they want to go further. They'll want to go from now knowing you to liking you and then finally trusting you enough to buy that thing or book that service. We're going to look now very quickly at answering questions. This is a great way to be able to spike the algorithm to say, oh, here's an answer to a question because there are tons of questions that people ask every day. The example on screen is, where can I stay in Kakadu? And what it does, instead of going to the Kakadu tourism site, which will list only their particular places to stay, which is then uh, going to the Crocodile Hotel or the Coinda Lodge. And then says, look, it's the Alligator Billabong Campground, the Amberdeck Kakadu Resort Campground, the Burradalba Bat Campground, the Coinda Campground, the Caravan Park, Four Mile. It lists all the different places and it goes down below and actually tells you about the hotels and the accommodation options as well, not just the campgrounds. Whereas the, the localized Kakadu Tourism One, which is a company, not a tourism organization, not a tourism uh, association, just lists their own things. So this is the higher um, quality, higher value and much more brought up response you'll get when you look for where to stay in Kakadu, simply because it has more valid information in. And they've gone in for those dot points. Google loves a dot point. It loves points that are structured. In fact, it loves data that is structured in numbers, dot points, spread out. It likes emphasis. If you need to make for an emphasis, you really want to be found for something on that page, emphasize it in bold or put it in um, italics because that will naturally make Google stop and go, oh, this is obviously important information that will tell me more about what I need to know on this particular page. So think about with questions, the kind of things that you, um, that would be about your business, the top 10 questions that your customers would ask you. And I ask you to actually do this in your own time because it's actually a bit of fun to do it. Writing out what are the top 10 things that customers would ask you normally. If you've got customers, if you're very new to business, it might be a little bit you know, light on questions, but you can start to ask the opposite, which is what are the top 10 things that you wish people would ask about you? So this gives you a chance then to see, okay, I can write questions, which means that I know the questions people are asking, so I can preempt those questions coming from the public and answer them on my website, which will help me to be much more easily found out there in the world. So when it comes to writing to be found, we're going to go into a bit more depth now on some of these things and seeing some examples that may work for you. So what does attract search results is product pages. They're the first thing that people look for when they're going shopping online. Blog posts and articles, which allow you to show your expertise and to prove to people that you know what you're talking about. Lists, everyone loves a list. How many times do you go to look for somewhere to go on holidays or go and stay somewhere or go and eat somewhere and you're looking at a top 10 list? What's the top 10 places to eat in town while I'm here in Sydney or while I'm here in, in Adelaide? What am I going to see when I'm in Adelaide? What are the top five things you must do before you die in Adelaide? Um, not that anyone's looking to die in Adelaide right now. And then the similar to the list is what we call guides and how-tos. Now, guides and how-tos are basically, as you see, how to do this, how to get to there. That kind of article is great on Google because it's another thing which proposes a question. How do I get to Lorella Springs? And it'll give you an, and instructions and often maps and directions on how to get to Lorella Springs. How do I get from the Gold Coast to the Sunshine Coast as quick as possible? And there'll be a guide out there that answers that. And the best possible guide, the most um, you know, credible guide, the guide that actually says the most detail and really breaks it down for you is probably the one that's going to win. Also, a little bit of credibility if it's coming from a government service or a government uh, organization or someone like, um, like the RACQ or the RAA or whatever the, um, the particular group that you have representing motorists in your particular state or territory. And then finally, landing pages. And landing pages are all about specific pages for specific purposes. And they're usually about doing one thing and one thing alone. That's usually getting the sale or the booking or the, or the, the phone call or the click, getting someone to action what you want them to action. So we take a look, we took a little bit of a look at product pages before. I'm going to expand this out a little bit and look at focus what's in it for them. Yeah, we said that. You will, you are, you have um, those sort of you words. We, we explained what that was all about. Benefits before features. I'm adding another thing in here called lifestyle context. I'm going to expand on this a bit in here. So let's just say we've got a picture of a yellow mid-length dress. 
So it's all we know about it so far, it's yellow, it's mid-length and it's a dress. So if we go then and look in Google for yellow mid-length dresses, we'll see a bit of a problem. Now I'm gonna show you how this works in Google. So I'm gonna go into here and type yellow mid-length dress. So if I look for yellow mid-length dress, I see some options in Google for dresses I can buy, the yellow and mid-length, or it's close to the kind, like they've got a lot of maxi dresses in there. I've got a thing called Keywords Anywhere that's plugged into my browser. And this allows me to see details about what are the things that people are lo looking for. So over here, it's telling me on the search engine, on the search analysis of yellow mid-length dress, it tells me that the SEO difficulty of this, of getting someone to come to my site for this is about 64%. So it's fairly difficult to get a response to. The on-page difficulty, the things that you have to do on your page to make this work over time is about 58%. So not stupid, ridiculously um, hard to do, but it's, it's fairly hard to achieve. Then it will tell me down the bottom, what are the other things that people are searching for when they look for yellow mid-length dresses? There's people who are just looking for yellow dresses. And it's telling me 6,600 people in Australia every month are searching for yellow mid-length, yellow, mid yellow dresses down to about 320 are looking for yellow summer dresses per month. Now that will rise and fall as we can see in the chart here, it's showing us that summer, so at the end of the year, yellow summer dress, you're not gonna be looking for that in winter, are you? You're gonna be looking for that in summer. So in winter, we see very little activity, but in summer, we see a lot more activity. In fact, if I hover over that, it will actually show me what that activity is like. So November, 2020, 480 people, November, um, and then we go through the middle of the year. So in June, in the middle of winter, we've got like 70 people a month looking for it way, way less people. What this is telling me is that there's other options I've got in here. As I break it down further, and these long tail keywords are telling me that there are some searches, but not many of them for very specific searches. So if I look at that particular dress, and I'll bring us back to that presentation, it's not just a yellow mid-length dress. It's got a few other attributes to it as well. The features. So the features are, it's a yellow mid-length dress, but it's also patterned. It's also elbow length sleeved. It's got a tie up waist. It's got an empire, well, almost an empire line. It's not quite empire. It's a bit high waisted um, and a round neck button up. So there's all the things I was able to pull out about that specific kind of dress. All of those things can form part of what you're writing on your website to get people to look at that dress. So if you're selling a yellow mid-length dress and you've got a name for it and it's got a, all sorts of different sizes and availabilities, then you've got to go a little bit deeper into it because some people might be looking for a yellow mid-length dress, but others may be looking for a yellow patterned dress or an elbow length sleeve yellow dress or a tie up waist dress or an empire lion dress that happens to be yellow. So you want to be able to get those results for all of those things. All those things are true, but they're not necessarily always painted out for you when you go to say a, a dress shop site or you go to a makeup site or you go to a um, you know, any sort of service that doesn't really explain to you the fullness of what it is they do because they're wrapped up in technical jargon or marketing talk or they're like they're, they're, they're referring to references that very few people actually know about. So when they go searching for those things and they see all these references, they're not seeing what it is they're looking for. But if you can write what people are looking for in such a way i'm not telling you that you have to have a a, a title that says yellow mid-length patterned elbow length sleeve tie up waist empire line brown neck button up dress that would be ridiculous but you can weave that into your story and the part of the way you weave that into your story is by taking these features and matching them to a benefit so the next slide then shows us how to do that let me present that so you can actually see it on screen so right now we can see that we have not just a yellow mid-length dress, but it's a yellow mid-length dress you'll, that will help you to stand out in the crowd. It's also a patterned yellow mid-length dress because those finger food oopsies won't ruin your night. So a patterned dress helps to hide, you know, drops of food and, and, and water and stuff like that. It's an elbow length sleeve, so you won't be shivering after dark. It's a tie up waist, so everything feels like it's tucked up in its place. It's an empire line that flattens out the tummy. A round neck button up, which is allowing your button up to be warm and unbuttoned to cool off. 
So it allows you then to expand beyond just what the features are. It's yellow, it's mid-length, it's pattern, it's elbow length sleeve. And it ascribes to each of those features some kind of benefit to the person. This is where you're going beyond writing for just SEO. And you're now starting to write for a person, a real live person who wants to either stand out in the crowd, make sure she wears something she's not going to feel too self-conscious if she spills half a food on it. She's one of um, you know, wanting to be uh, not cold after dark. So having a, a longer sleeve will help her to stay a little bit warmer. Um, flattening out the tummy, who doesn't want to do that in this day and age? Oh, I don't think there's an empire line big enough that'll ever hide my tummy. Or the idea that you can button up to be warm and unbutton to be cool allows you to expand beyond just simply going, here's my list of things I want to do, uh, want to say about the product. But Here's what it means to someone. Here's how it applies to their life. And then we go a little step further to really write for that person and really get behind them. So we're going from the realm of search engine optimization to what we now call conversion optimization, providing information and context for someone's life. And then we go beyond the benefits into what we call lifestyle context. It's a yellow mid-length dress made for the office and after work drinks. So we're putting it into a context. This dress is ideal to be worn in the office, but also to be worn to after work drinks. So that could be any kind of woman who works in an office, who goes to Friday drinks, doesn't want to have to take an extra dress with her, wants to be able to just comfortably go out from one context into another. We've been able to gather all that just from this being a yellow mid-length dress. And you get this information by understanding who your customer is, what's important to them. Why is this dress being designed the way it is? Why is it patterned? Well, it's great for a casual, tidy look at dinner. It's a yellow length sleeve that covers up tattoos when you're seeing the family. That's a fantastic way to do it when you're going to church or something like that. It's a tie up waist that matches so you don't need to buy a belt. That's a lifestyle context. I don't have to go and buy something extra to have this awesome outfit. It's an empire line that works well when you've had a bit too much dinner. That's a lifestyle context rather than just a feature and a benefit, it now says there's a feature, there's a benefit, and here's the context that you'll use it for in your life. And a round neck button up is good from that transition from office to cocktails. So that's taking the features about this particular product, all these particular service that you might have, and bringing it into someone's life. Not just saying it's good for this because of this, it's good for this because of this, and you can use it in this context in your life. That is using psychology to take a product that could be just anything, could be a bottle of water that I'm just holding in my left hand that I don't have to hold there because it disappears. I hold it in front of me so I can actually see it. It's more than just a bottle of water. It's hydration that lasts me through the day and provides me with a classy looking bottle on, the, on, the, on my bench so I don't look like a complete like plastic bottle bogan. I can just keep filling up my water bottle during the day and feel good. So you've got all that. You've got your lifestyle content. What else is it that attracts search results? We're talking now about blog posts and articles on your website. So your blog posts and your articles, we were looking at that a bit earlier around asking a question in the title, answering that question in the first paragraph directly, and then using your dot points in order to go this point, this point, this point, they back up what I'm saying in that, that sentence above. And then you expand those dot points using subtitles. So you use those subtitles as you're going down the page ending with a clear call to action. An example of what this kind of looks like is this one. This is an article that I wrote for my website all about what are the top kinds of content on Facebook. So I said the type of content seems to be cutting through the noise according to this linked report seems to be either memes, humanitarian content, or cats, dogs, and babies. Maybe we've been overthinking our content strategies just a little. Let's take a closer look at this. So we're going to the first point, which is about memes. Riddles are the king, memes are the queen. I've got a photo there to break it up. And then I actually go into a discussion about what the particular memes that seem to be doing really well happen to be and what the riddles are and what are the things that seem to be really, really performing top at the top of Facebook's um, you know, uh, interactions report. So that answers the question straight away says memes, humanitarian content, cats, dogs, and babies. If I'm just scanning that page and I happen to found, find it, then I immediately go, oh yeah, okay, cats, dogs, and babies, I've got it. Um, and I can just jump straight out if I want to. But if I want to find out more about what that actually means, what are memes? What is humanitarian content? Let's dig a bit deeper down the page and find those subtitles. So if I'm looking specifically for humanitarian content, 
then I want to go a little bit further down the page just to the part that says humanitarian content and it makes sense to me because that's what I'm looking for that's what I'm interested in and that's what I'm going to read another example is another one of these how to tell your business story another article on my website as a small business, you're supposed to know how to manage your finances, pay your rent, blah, 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 blah. But it's a lot easier to work out what the story might be if you follow this guide. Here is the guide. Understand the then, the but, and the therefore. These are the three little words between everything that comes to sharing a story. I did a webinar about this yesterday, actually. So it's um, very much in topic at the moment. And then I expand on each of those points, the understanding the then, I go the importance of the then, and then I explain what I mean by that in a few paragraphs before I move on through to the next point. And then the next point, and then I wrap it up in a nice little tidy bow at the end. What I've done there is said how to tell your business story. So if someone is listening to a webinar and some fool is saying, go and learn how to do story, you got to learn your business's story. And they can type into Google and go, how to tell my business story. And this article may come up as one of the options. I don't know if it does yet, it might. And then I can bring it up and say, here's the outline about what the business story is. There's an easy answer, understanding the then button, the therefore. And because they're very vague terms, I can, as the reader, go down the page and learn about what the actual meaning of those things are, rather than just assuming that I'm going to work it out from those dot points. Lists are a fun and foolproof way of guaranteeing that you will get more views on your website over time. BuzzFeed has proven this. Top 10 lists on everything from YouTube through to individual blog posts for people have shown that we love a list. Humanity loves to categorize things in a little list so we can just tick them off. The screenshot I've got there is when I did a search, I, was, I actually wrote this originally when I was in Alice Springs. I wrote down what, what's, uh, what, to do, what is there to do in Alice Springs? Top, top things to do in Alice Springs. And it brought me a list of 10 things. Number four was wander through the beautiful gardens and it gave me a link to the olive pink botanical gardens where I could find out more about this desert based botanical garden, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. There actually is a thing. Or I can try one of the world's best desert golf courses, which is, happens to be the view that I have over from my hotel. So I go, okay, so I can see a list of these things. Everywhere I go, I look at top 10 lists, the top three places to dine, the top two steak restaurants, the top three vegetarian um, lunches. All those sort of searches are just so common on Google. So if you've got a, a, some sort of list that you could have in your business, it could be a list that's something down the thing of the 25, 26 affordable gifts to help you master Secret Santa this year. I always need that because Secret Santa is just a hell. Like they give you a $20 limit and everyone goes and spends about 50 bucks on it. So you feel like an idiot when you turn up with a $20 gift, 26 affordable gifts to help you master secret Santa this year. That's a fantastic way of starting off on a solving a problem. This is what lists really want to do. Some of those lists may be looking for the 10 best restaurants in Townsville. That's great. It immediately gave me one the IMC Steakhouse at the very top of it, if you love steak. And it goes on to describe a bit about Townsville's laid back attitude and not lacking in fine dining restaurants. And there's restaurants that feature everything from fine modern Australian cuisine through the best of Asia and the Pacific as well. But what I'm looking for is what the 10 best restaurants in Townsville are. So I scroll down there and then there's 10 restaurants that I can judge based upon their merits and the description written on it. And I can make my choice based on that. I travel a lot into states. So for me to get articles like that really means something to me. So if you've got a restaurant, you can say that the top five restaurants in this town where you are, list you know, four other restaurants that you think are really good and make sure yourself is in there as well. So you don't have to worry about linking to other people. People are going to find other restaurants anyway. They're not just going to make a decision to not come to you unless they really really don't want to go into you. They, might, they, they just want something else extra. You're not trying to force someone to walk in your door. What you're trying to do is give them the options and show them why your options are so good and why they should try you based on your own merits. So what could you write a top 10 list about? This is where I usually would drag you in, but there's only a couple of you on the, on the webinar tonight, so I don't want to embarrass you too much. But even if you want to just pop in the chat, um, just what it is that your business does 
and I can give you back um, a, a couple of lists that you could write top tens about. Because I think these are one of the most effective, easy to write ways and quickest ways to build a really good basis of, of a material for your website, stuff that you can you know, put on your website and attract more search, attract more search results for. Um, I like to do top 10 lists of, you know, the top three things, uh, top three pieces of software to use to post to Facebook or something like, the best three places to learn how to master Google Google Ads, or the top ten um, digital marketers in Australia um, voted by me. Things like that, where I can actually highlight other professionals in my space and show who I think are the people that are really worth looking at. Now, yeah, I sure I want people to work with me but I'm not for everyone's taste. Not everyone likes this bald chubby guy. Maybe they want to work with someone else. Maybe they want to work with a woman, for instance. That option should be there. And I'm happy to point people to those people because I know lots of great marketers who I really do rate highly, many of them who are on this digital solutions program as well. So if you go away and look at what are the things that you may be able to write a top 10 about, then we move on to guides and how to so what attracts search results more than a guide or a how-to is actually answering that question. How to do this, how to get there, how to cool down, how to deal with, how to you know, understand whatever. What are the how-tos that you could go to? There's so, so many of them. It could be a how-to of, for instance, how to start drinking coffee if you're not a coffee drinker. How, to, um, how best to avoid lactose in your diet how to find the scent that, may, that works for you, your home, and your pets. That's one little fast fact that I learned from an article was just about how to, is how to, because um, I was mining someone's pet and it was for quite a lengthy amount of time while they were in hospital. And so I was like, how to make your, how to make your house smell great without, um, without damaging your pet's health. And I didn't realize that tea tree oil is highly, highly poisonous to dogs. You should never have tea tree oil smell in your house when you've got dogs because it's actually a really dangerous poison to them. So I was like, oh my goodness, I love tea tree oil usually. So usually my go-to would be eucalyptus and tea tree oil. So when it was eucalyptus, okay, yeah, dogs like that, but not tea tree oil. So I was like, well, I actually helped my friend keep their dog alive by actually going and writing a how-to or reading a how-to article on something so simple. Or it could be something like how to light a campfire. You, know, that you wouldn't imagine that would be a really difficult thing to do. But when you're out in a wet bush and it's being damp and you don't have a lot of options and you've only got a few matches left, you want to be able to do that in the right way. And to then also in this country, not set off a bloody bushfire. Nobody wants to light a bushfire just so they can toast their marshmallows on a camping trip at night. So making sure that you can write really good how-to articles makes you very useful and when you become very useful guess what happens to your rank on google it goes up 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 because more and more people need that useful information those life hacks those how to do these things around the house how to shop better how to how to get an aldi um, supermarket trolley when you don't have a coin all these amazing little life hacks are so so popular that they've now become even a very popular tool of TikTok and Instagram Reels. Now we look at your homework, which is writing a guide or a how-to. What would you write about? What's something you know about that you can write a guide to? Because this kind of stuff really, really helps when it comes to writing. So your how-to can be written in the form of step one, step two, step three. Because that is what Google calls structured data, it allows people to then go, huh, easily go down through a list of one through 10 or 20 or 30, however many steps you've got. But Google likes that because it's easy for them to display. It's really simple for them to be able to produce on a screen and easy for their algorithm to be able to index and understand. So we can go, okay, we understand this is a really good article. We can see how popular it is. It's been around for a while. There's good comments about it on social media that we've been able to pull. And we've been able to compare it to other articles and see that this has some merit in terms of content. So you can go away now and learn how to write your own guide or your own how-to quickly and easily. The final one I want to talk to you about is landing pages. Landing pages are a little bit controversial because they're not always something which you would use for 
SEO or being found on Google. Quite often a landing page is more directly uh, linked through to an ad. You're running an ad that says, um, buy this uh, special before the end of November um, at this link. And you go to some weird and wonderful link, which is not related to your website necessarily, or might be, um, but quite often it's not. And all you do on that link is buy that particular product or book that particular session or learn about that particular thing. And that's all about you just being able to get people to do that one thing you want them to do. And that is to convert or buy or book that thing to take that action that you want them to. And that's what a, a landing page is all about. But it can be about more. A landing page can be about things that are trendy right now. So you don't necessarily want them even indexing in Google. You might just want to connect them through to an ad. But in some cases, you do want to be found for that place um, that was showing in that top end wedding movie uh, that they went and had dinner at. And you're looking, okay, you want to be found for that because you are the place that they had dinner at. Well, then good. Write it in such a way that it matches what people are looking for. Have a landing page that says where the, where the coffee house that was featured in that movie. We are um, the flower shop on that street that you saw in uh, Blue Healers. We are the, the rafters favorite um, coffee shop that we would have seen on, on Back to the Rafters and the new Netflix series called Back to the Rafters or something like that. It'll be something where it goes to a specific trend or a specific topic or a specific kind of person. You could write a specific page. So on our websites, generally the information we've got is for general consumption. It's for people of all ages and all ethnicities and all groups to be able to get a great understanding of our products and services and know how to buy our stuff, right? Well, a landing page is the opposite of that. A landing page lets you get specific, lets you get niched, lets you get really, really down to the granular facts about a specific person. You're not just writing this for anyone. You're writing it for a woman who's aged between 35 and 45, probably has a couple of kids. They're getting sort of in their teen, upper teens now. She's about to change her career and she really, really wants a patterned yellow dress so she can go from the office to cocktails at night. So you know who you're writing about. You can't put that in the product page in there because that needs to appeal to a lot more people than just her. But you really want her, who's the perfect person with this dress, to see this particular page. It's all about her, and all about this yellow dress that she's being going, going to be able to use. So you can get very, very specific on a landing page. I don't have examples here to show except for this top end wedding one, which is the landing page used by Tourism Top End that says, you know, if you want to see the places that were um, featured in, top, in the top end in that movie, such as um, Kakadu National Park, Arnhem Land, Tiwi Islands, uh, Catherine Gorge, the town of Catherine, the Darwin region, then what you've got to do is see this landing page, you've got to see all those places and how to visit them, stay at them, um, go and, and, and go on an adventure in them, eat at them, all those kind of options. You don't always have to have your landing page visible on Google and they're usually not linked to your menu. They're not a page that you can get to by navigating around your website. They're a very specific page for a very specific person searching for a very specific thing or linked from an ad that was geared towards someone very specific as well. So landing pages are something you can have a lot of fun with. Think about as you go away, what are the kind of landing pages that you could produce? What landing pages would help you to be able to sell more of your product, we'll be able to get you more bookings for your service, we'll be able to help you out in all the things you're trying to sell, promote, or somehow get people to interact with, what are the landing pages you could work on there? That brings us to the end of this particular overview. I'd like to work with you further if um, you'd like to learn more about writing for Google. It's something which I've had a great deal of success with. I've now got 20 pages, which are now getting over 300 people viewing them every week. Um, I've got one particular page that I wrote for that now, and this is for a digital marketing agency, not exactly the most thrilling destination in the world, but I've managed to write continually and consistently Articles that attract traffic. Now, will they help me out with um, more people using my services in the area that I serve? Well, maybe not. But then again, one of the ranking factors in Google is the popularity of your website. I've got a pretty popular website now. So if you'd like a bit of a hand with how to do that, 
the Digital Solutions Program is a $44 program that gives you three hours of one-to-one -one with myself or some of the other amazingly talented advisors at Business Station. If you want to reach out to me and uh, speak more about that, that's my email address on screen, Dante at businessstation.com.au, or you could hunt me down and, and catch me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram. I'm more than happy to have a chat with you on there to see what are some of the things that you're trying to achieve and also how we can help achieve those through the Digital Solutions Program as well. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I know you could be doing many more, more other things, um, but you're taking time out of your business to work on your business, and that's always a good thing. And I hope to see you in the next one of these webinars, and they're always free, so check them out.